All right, hello everyone. This is Professor Dustin, and I am the group leader for the Merrimack College Astronomical Research Group. And in this video, I'm going to give a very brief introduction to photometry using the AVSO program VFOT. Uh, this is specifically designed to get new students who have just joined the group uh, into doing photometry as quickly as possible. If anybody else is out there who's interested in photometry, certainly you are welcome to watch, but I have a very specific goal, and that's to get students into it as soon as possible. And so I'm not going to be going into a lot of the finer details of photometry. It's actually a very complicated topic. There are entire books written on photometric techniques and approaches, and I'm not going to cover any of that, just basically how to get students who have taken a picture with the telescope getting the magnitude of a star using differential photometry. So I'm going to be using AAVSO. There's two different features of AAVSO I'm going to be using, primarily VFOT, and then also we're going to be using the variable star plotter to try to identify which star we're looking at. So you want to first log in at the AAVSO website. So use one of the two usernames that uh, we have access to, which you should already know what those are. We are going to be using two different features of AAVSO. Primarily we're going to be using um, the data analysis tool, VFOT, so I'm just going to open that up. So you can see once I go into VFOT, um, we have a bunch of images here um, already. This is the image, this, this is the object, ATEL13257. That's the image I'm going to use for this um, demo. But you can see there's a whole bunch of images up here. Um, what we did for this is we told iTelescope to automatically send the images to VFOT so we didn't have to upload them. If you need to get the images into VFOT, you can go over to Upload go quick upload and then you have to um, say which telescope you're using because um, the various parameters of the telescope control how the analysis is done so you have to know which telescope you're going to use you can add in some custom ones OGS is the one at Merrimack and then I had to do a T40 custom one because they don't know what about T40 at, at uh, VFOT and then you can upload an image this is one example where um, if you're using Chrome I think you can upload uh, a good set of images whereas if you're using Firefox you can only do one at a time that's very frustrating obviously um, but just something that we have to deal with on occasion. So let's go back to the images. And I'm just going to open up this image so we can see what it looks like. Yeah, and it will take a while to load. That's because there's a lot of data here, but also because T40, the telescope we use, has a massive field of view. So the, these images are huge. Um, and you can see that I'm only looking at a very small part of the image. So let me zoom as far out as I can get so we can see the whole thing. Yeah, it's taking quite a while to populate it out so we can actually see what it looks like. Okay, so there are thousands of stars in this image, and one of them is a star that we want the magnitude of, which is our, which is our source, um, but we, we have no idea which one it is. Right now it should be the one in the dead center of the image, but often it's not, or we want to verify, and even that's not really good enough. There's a whole bunch of stars in the dead center, right? So we need to identify which source it is. Um, this source came from uh, this original discovery paper. It's called Maxi J063743. So it has a name, and it also has a location. Since it has a name and a location, we can use the AAVSO um, variable star plotter to actually find out exactly which star this is by getting a picture of the, of the field of stars. So to do that, I'm just going to go back, click AAVSO again, it will open in another tab, and then I'm going to go to observing variable star charts, variable star plotter. So this is going to plot a region of the sky around a particular star. Um, the easiest way to do this is if you have the name of the object, you can just cut and paste the name in, and since I have that, I'm going to do that right here. You can also put in the right ascension declination coordinates if you like. You need to choose a preferred chart scale. I believe that uh, you know E or D is usually the appropriate one to use. Um, you can play around with that a little bit. Um, you know, this part is a little bit challenging. We would like the orientation to always be CCD, but you can see that in many cases it's not, and in this case it's not. None of these orientations are particularly helpful for us, so we're going to use reversed because it worked a little bit better for me at the time I did this before. You, you know, this is a tricky aspect of it. Um, I'm going to show you how to try to, even if you don't have the orientation, to try to figure out which star you actually want to look at. Um, we want to plot a chart, not the photometry table, and you can put in an ID if you want to catch it later, like Maxi. So then later you can do just maxi 10 or whatever, and then you can find that chart based on the name. Um, in this case, I have to change the magnitude limit to be a little bit dimmer so we can actually see some dimmer stars. You don't always have to do that. Um, that's kind of a playing around with the system a little bit. Then you can just plot the chart. That plot chart didn't exist. Sorry, sorry. Get rid of the ch oh, let's get rid of that. See, it, okay, so you don't want to use that chart ID. Overrides all our fields in this form. Okay, don't do that. 
Okay, so here's the um, star field, and you can see that initially there are definitely some patterns, and that's what you want to do, is you want to start to look for patterns in the stars so you can tell which is the right source. Um, you can see there's three stars in a line here, and there's like this little five star making a triangle. So if you go back to our image, and zoom out a bunch again, You can indeed see that we have that pattern. We have three stars in a row right here, and we have this little triangle. Of course, it's oriented differently, and that's just because of this challenge with the orientation. It looks like maybe north is to the right in this image, whereas north is probably up in this image. So, um, But what we're going to do is we're going to use star hopping. So we're going to hop around um, looking for patterns in the stars to try to figure out which star we're actually looking at. So first, I'm going to zoom in a bunch, because clearly I really want to just be looking at um, those two distinctive star patterns, that three stars in a row, and that uh, triangle-shaped five-star pattern up there. So there's there's the three in a row, and the five is up there. So I'm like right in between, looking mostly at the three-star pattern now. So if I go over to the star chart where I know the actual source, it's circled here. It's actually, there's no source there because this is a new source. Um, you know, AAVSO knows that the name is this Maxi J0637-430, but it doesn't know that there's an actual source there, so that's why that that's why that little circle is empty. But you can see that what we're going to do is we're going to try to use the pattern of this these stars right here to identify which is the actual source in our image. So first, we we saw those big bright three stars, um, so we're going to start there. You're going to see if you follow those big bright three stars, you get to another triple of three stars right there. So let's try to identify those three. That's pretty easy. You can see one, two, three are the bright stars. One, two, three are the other stars. So we have now we've now figured out what this star is. That's this guy. Now we can jump from this guy to go one, two stars over, and then one more star is our source. So one, two, and then and then our final star. This looks like a double star, maybe. So we want to try to identify that in the picture as well. So remember, we got one, two, three, one, two, three, one. Two, and this is indeed a double star as shown on the chart. And then the next star is going to be our source. So it's like one of the one of the stars in here. So maybe if we can find these two stars, we can identify which source it is. And you can see that you can actually do that. One, two, so now we're looking in this region, but there's these two stars here. So in a line from our double star to those other two stars, that's where the source is. And so you can do that. There's our double star, there's those two stars, so obviously our source is right there. So now that we have identified the source, I'm going to click on it, and we can name it and do some have some other options and stuff. I don't necessarily need to do any of that kind of that stuff. It's saying we're a fixed target. The target is what we really care about is that it's named a target. So that's going to go away, and then you can see that we've added these rings around our target star. So the way that you actually find um, th those rings are going to be used for the analysis. Um, but the way you actually find the magnitude, the brightness of that star, is you compare the brightness of that star in this image to the known brightness of other stars in this image. And AEVSO has a huge database of stars for which the magnitudes are known and very stable. And so basically when you take a picture, you can guarantee that those stars are of a magnitude you know, and you can use them how bright they are in this image to find the brightness of this star. A couple of different ways of doing that. Um, there's a number of different catalogs up here. Generally, we use the comp stars, but in fact, for these kinds of estimates, where you're not you're not looking for a very very accurate uh, photometric report, um, you just want to get an estimate of how bright the star is. You can use any of those catalogs. Will work for this. So now we've uh, selected a whole bunch and uh, automatically selected a whole bunch of other stars. These are comparison stars in contrast to our target star. And now we want to decide what those rings mean and if those rings need to be adjusted. And to talk about that, I'm going to zoom in on this bright star down here, 132. So 132 is over here. Let's zoom in one more. So what these three rings mean, so the, the, the image is made up of pixels, right? And just like, the, just like your camera on your phone or your digital camera is made up of pixels, um, the number of counts in the pixel tells you how many photons fell on the image. Now, it's not exactly a one-to-one -one correspondence, but it's a linear relationship. So if you have twice as many photons, then you know you get twice as many electrons out, uh, roughly, or we hope. And that's the feature that allows us to do photometry um, on these, uh, using this kind of, this kind of equipment. 
So the inside ring here is called the source ring. That's going to be, you know, you're declaring to the computer program that all the counts inside that ring are source counts. They're from the actual thing you want to measure. Outside that ring is um, the background annulus, and this is skipped. So basically nothing happens inside this um, this middle ring here. This is the source ring. This is skipped so that you are well separated from the source in the background. And then this uh, annulus here is the background. So basically what you want to do is you want to count everything inside um, everything inside the source and subtract out everything that's in the background. And the program is going to do that for you, but you do need to make some decisions about how big these rings are. And so you can do that by going up to tools and aperture and sky annulus. So these settings are in pixels, so you can see that the source pixel is 5 in radius. Um, the inner sky annulus, which gives you the dead zone between the source and the background, is 10, and then the sky annulus is 5. You know, one general rule of thumb is to keep the, fir the first number and the last number the same, so the size of the aperture radius, the source, is the same as the width of the sky annulus. Basically, you want lots and lots of background for your source, and since the since the uh, radius is bigger of the background ring, if you put the width the same, you get a much bigger background than you do source, and that's what you want. But here we have a little bit of a problem with 132, which is our brightest source, and that's that it's pretty elongated. It's not circular like the other stars are. This guy is also elongated. This is clearly some kind of double star. Maybe 132 is actually a double star that's not being resolved. So really, really that means that we probably shouldn't be using 132 as our comparison star. And so I'm going to remove that in the next step. But I want to demonstrate how you can see that that's true because there's some source light that's falling outside of the source collection region. So that means that our source counts is actually going to be wrong. We have some definite light that's falling outside of the source ring. In contrast, if you look at 145, basically all the source counts are going to be inside the source ring. And if you sort of scroll around in this picture, you see that's true for most of the other ones um, in this image. So you can see that those rings, these numbers 5105 5, works pretty well for these um, for these sources, but it does not work well for 132, and we'll probably get rid of 132. When you're trying to decide how big to make these rings, you want to make sure that you basically enclose the source with the first ring. Uh, the the dead ring doesn't really matter, you know, because it's not going to be counted at all. And you want to make sure that there's no sources inside the background ring. For instance, if I change the width of the sky alien to be something really big, like 25. Yeah, see this one now, this is now counted as background, but there's a source in the background. So you don't want to make the sky the background sky annulus so big as to include sources because it's supposed to be just the background, just the ambient light from the sky, probably from our atmosphere. And so you don't want to include we want to get a good estimate of that, so we don't want to include sources in that estimate. So I'm gonna make set this back down to five. Okay, so now that I think I've got some pretty good aperture settings, I'm going to go to view photometry report. I can change which sources I'm using here, but you can change it just as easily in the photometry report. Um, I also want to point out that we have some numbers here that can tell us something about how good the data is. SNR is signal to noise ratio. For photometry, you really want to be at least at 50 and really over 100 to get good photometry. So you can see our target has really bad signal to noise. So we, this this image is probably not usable from for a scientific perspective unless we stack a whole bunch of them on top of each other um, because the signal to noise is so small. But you can see like for 132, the brightest star, the signal to noise is very high and even for the other comparisons, uh, these two at the bottom might be too small so we might get rid of them. Um, you can do that here but like I said you can do that when you do view photometry report as well. So we do have a problem with this particular star. You can see that the magnitude estimate is zero, even despite the fact that all the comparison stars are active. That's because we didn't use a photometric filter for this. We took this in a clear filter. That's actually good advice for some sources, but in order to then get a magnitude estimate for it, we need to, um, you know, there's no non-photometric magnitudes for these sources. You can see that for the comparison sources, they all have a zero magnitude, so there's no data there. So no data is being used to try to calculate its magnitude because the computer knows that it doesn't have any luminance data, any clear data for these, some no filter data for these sources. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use, for magnitude estimation, I'm just going to change this to the B filter. So then if I do refresh, uh, we actually get a magnitude, and what's what's happening is that uh, VFOT is using the B magnitudes for all of the comparison stars to tell us what the magnitude of star 1 is. Now we should probably report this. I'm not sure how we should report this because it is actually a luminance picture, but we're using the blue magnitudes to determine what that magnitude is. Now for the purposes of this uh, 
this set of images, this is for a cataclysmic variable star, and this is actually the right procedure to use for those guys because the people we're sending the data to know that this is true. They know that there aren't any luminance magnitudes and that people just use B or sometimes use V to get the magnitude of that thing. Um, but generally, you want to actually have the photometric filter, the correct photometric filter, and have them match. Um, so anyway, but so for this, 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 this magnitude is an estimate using the now the V magnitudes, which is about in the visual band of um, these comparison stars. You can see that you know all the comparison stars are being used, so that's good. That means that this is using as much data as we have to figure out what magnitude that is. But I also said that I didn't really like 132, so I'm going to make 132 not active. I'm also going to make the bottom two not active because they are quite faint and their signal to noise ratio is not great. So I'm going to turn those guys off as well and then refresh, and you can see that the magnitude will change. Well, it didn't change very much. I mean, it changed in the like second decimal place. Um, these red um, colors are showing that, so here's the target estimate. So this is like if you used 139 alone, you would get an estimate which is 0.484, which is the highest, is the most wrong of all of these estimates, the most, the, the largest distance away from that, um, from that estimate. So you could maybe decide not to use that guy because maybe you consider that one to be an outlier. But in general, my attitude is that, you know, think about it beforehand. I removed 132 because I thought it was elongated and probably not a good estimate of the magnitude. And I removed 161 and 165 because I thought maybe they were too dim and their signal to noise ratio wasn't good. But if these are all good measurements of these stars, then these should be valid estimates for the magnitude of the target. So I'm just going to leave them all. And this gives you your final magnitude estimate, 16.464. So this is basically the simple way to get a very really quick magnitude um, from a single source on a single night. And so when you're like monitoring observations, this is a good way to like decide, oh, we need more exposure time or we need less exposure time. Obviously, in this case, we would want more because the signal-to-noise ratio is only 23. So we want, we want to have a longer exposure to get that signal-to-noise ratio higher. Um, but this is the end of what I wanted to show you is how to get that magnitude. Now you can also use VFOT to get what's called a light curve, so that's a magnitude as it changes over time. I'm not going to show you how to do that, but I'll just point to where it is. If you go back to images, and you can do time series, and then select a number of these, and then you can do it automatically, do it on one day, and then it will copy all those parameters to every other day, and it will spit out a nice light curve. Uh, I'm not going to go over how to do that in this video, because I really just want to get you introduced into the concept of doing photometry on VFOT. Um, so that's the end of this video. Thanks very much for watching. I hope it has been helpful, um, and I'll see you guys around.